Hi, my name is Nihal Katrigada. Hi, my name is Sean Ketterpal. And first, let's start off with the Persian Gulf War. So, let's start off with a little background. After the Cold War, there was a growing um, global connection because people weren't exactly tied to a certain alliance or certain countries. So now they began more trading and there were more countries trading with each other, therefore causing some interdependence. Now, with more trade, this and let's say less conflict, um, they were allowed to grow their industry and globalize more ideas. However, as they globalized and they grew the economies, um, a major natural resource that became in effect was oil. And oil became the leading resource for political and economic strength because it was used to power um, the industries and all this globalization and industry. Another important fact to start off with um, before we fully get into the Persian Gulf War is Saddam Hussein. Now, he was the Iraqi president during the time, and he actually served five terms until the U.S. Um, took him down in 2003, but we'll go on more into that later. Now, he had strong nationalist beliefs for Iraq. He was a very um, Iraqi-centered person and definitely wanted land, oil, and power. Now, with land and oil, that led to power. Therefore, he was very strict with his ruling. However, he was kind of questionable because some of his politics and military actions might have deviated from accepted standards. Let's jump into the Persian Gulf War. In August of 1990, the Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in hope of oil reserves. At this point, oil is one of the, if not, the most demanded global resources. Saddam Hussein also wanted to cancel Iraqi debt owed to Kuwait, as well as spreading Iraqi power to gain better positions closer to Saudi Arabia and the UAE, the United Arab Emirates. And with this, Kuwait was also um, holding t nearly 20% of the world's oil resources. Therefore, if successfully invaded, they would also set them up for heavy global oil control, therefore leading Iraq into a heavier, more influential stance for the world. Now, the United Nations had begun to fear this aggression for land, power, and economic strength. Global Interference The United Nations feared Iraqi takeover of Middle Eastern oil, which was a large majority of all global oil resources. Iraq remained obstinate and, as a result, annexed Kuwait. Therefore, to silence a possible attack, the United States and the European North Atlantic Trade Organization allies were sent to Saudi Arabia. Due to the annexation of Kuwait, the UN authorized the use of force if Iraq did not withdraw from Kuwait within two months. However, Saddam Hussein refused to give up his resources and Kuwait. As a result, the United States initially led an air campaign, which was known as the Operation Desert Storm. And, um, well, this, um, air campaign destroyed Iraq's communicational networks and also its air defenses. And that was followed by the Operation Desert Sabar that took place on land. Um, and that, um, eventually led to the retaking of Kuwait. Specifically, 16 out of the 24 members of the Arab League detested or despised Iraq's aggression and turned to the North Atlantic Trade Organization for support. The end and effects of the Persian Gulf War. Well, following Operation Desert Sabre, the Allied forces successfully drove Iraqi troops out of Kuwait. The immediate impact of their success was the liberation of Kuwait, as well as the humiliation of Iraq. Now, Iraq was subject to UN monitoring, stringent limits on their military activities, as well as economic sanctions, which are basically penalties on Iraq that may include various forms of trade barriers or financial restrictions. However, Hussein remained in power and the UN forces left without trying to bring him out. Hussein maintained his brutal dictatorship for another 10 years while also ignoring many of the treaty agreements following the war that allowed him to keep his power. Later, after all of this, in 2003, the US actually did take him and withdraw him out from power. And although Kuwait was a separate entity before Iraq, this is where it becomes a little ironic, um, Iraq invaded Kuwait, which reveals the global limitations of all these global trade organizations and alliances, because although Iraq was not 
a part of that, and Kuwait was and had some kind of protection under the League of Nations, Iraq still managed to take them over. Now let's talk about Al-Qaeda and terrorism. So, let me start off by saying that initially, Nar Muhammad Taraki sent Soviet troops to Afghanistan as his views resembled those of Karl Marx, who was, you know, who was a person um, with uh, communist ideologies. However, the conservative Afghans who were highly adherent to Islam considered themselves holy warriors and opposed Soviet intervention, which led to a destructive civil war in Afghanistan. As economic and social problems grew in the Soviet Union, Soviet troops were withdrawn from Afghanistan and a peace treaty was signed. Although the external influence diminished, internal warring factions persisted and exactly after 14 years of fighting, a fundamentalist group known as the Taliban rose to power. The Taliban exhibited terrorist activities and posed restrictions on women and reinforced Al-Qaeda under Osama bin Laden. Adding on, there is an interesting connection between the Persian Gulf War and the strengthening of Al-Qaeda. When Iraq invaded Kuwait, bin Laden created an army that was willing to combat Iraq. However, the Saudi government refused and seeked help from the United Nations. Terrorism and resentment grew as bin Laden despised American involvement, who claimed the United States was an enemy invader. The Al-Qaeda well, Let's start off with what exactly is the Al-Qaeda. The Al-Qaeda was a radical Islamic organization similar to the Taliban but with very strong Islamic beliefs and they felt that Islam should be globalized and practiced. However, they did not exactly force Islam on people but rather felt that violence was necessary to eradicate or essentially in their words silence those who were not the people of God and essentially those are the non-believers in Islam. And as Sean just said, this entirely backs up why they were completely against the U.S. and they felt that the U.S.'s popular culture and globalization was inhibiting the spread of Islam. Now, following conflict and terrorism, as I said before, the Al-Qaeda despised the intervention of the United States. And, like I said, um, this was because of the U.S.'s globalization but there were other, also other reasons. The U.S. had supported Israel, which was one of Al-Qaeda's primary targets and enemies. And Al-Qaeda was not exactly fond of people who opposed their ideas, as we can see with Islam. In addition, U.S. also had troops stationed in Saudi Arabia. And a little bit of background with this was because um, the Al-Qaeda had interests in Saudi Arabia, good to say. And uh uh, going back to U.S.'s popular culture and globalization, they were not fond of the U.S. being so close to where they were and where they started out. And like I said, and one of the most important that I can't reiterate enough, is that U.S. was a leader of globalization. Now with their strength with NAFTA and their leading industries, the U.S. spread a lot of ideologies and they were controlling a lot of those ideologies as well. Therefore, limiting the spread of Islam and Al-Qaeda's ideologies. Now, as internal conflicts began to increase and the heat between Al-Qaeda and the U.S. began to rise with U.S. having more influence in the Middle East, Osama bin Laden declared essentially a holy war or a jihad against the U.S. Now, here's where controversy arises. Osama bin Laden's holy war jihad was, I guess, deviated from the true meaning and fifth pillar, not fifth pillar, sorry, of jihad, the, um, the ideology of jihad in Islam. And this holy war is what led to the September 11th attacks in 2001 in New York. And um, in New York, the Pentagon, Pennsylvania, and these bombings um, were part of Osama bin Laden's attack against the U.S. And he wanted to symbolize his power to show that all the U.S. is growing, they are not weak. And another thing is the fatwas, the alliance within Al-Qaeda, were sent to Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Syria to fight American troops. Therefore, they were not just in infiltrating the U.S., they were also finding ways to take out the U.S. outside of their own domain. Resentment and conflict continued to persist in the Middle Eastern regions, um, and this was seen where the Al-Qaeda, oh, Bin Laden, and other leaders would send 
these Al Qaeda troops to take out U.S. soldiers. However, they did not have any limiting when it came to where they were bombing, and this can be seen as um, through the bombing in regular cities in the Middle East, where innocent people were getting killed as well. And on the left, you can see um, a picture of the 9/11 bombings in New York um, at the Twin Towers specifically. Um, as this killed so many innocent people just to symbolize Al-Qaeda's strength. And this really portrays the extent they were willing to go. Now we'll be listing some prominent groups that rallied with the Al-Qaeda and others that serve a threat to our world even today. So, Al-Qaeda operated globally and its primary alliances were the National Islamic Front and the Egyptian Islamic Jihad that planned attacks that planned attacks against its Western enemies. In fact, Al-Qaeda established a great number of financial and business transactions and made utmost efforts to procure nuclear weapons. These terrorist groups have excelled in the use of firearms and deciphering codes and passwords, which are like all sorts of different counterintelligence methods due to the effectual training camps in Afghanistan that many encountered. Um, Furthermore, Al-Qaeda had salient influences in Sudan and the Iran government, which have caused the Middle Eastern regions to become violent in general. Later, in 1999, whose basis was the Al-Qaeda organization, another radical Islamic group from Syria and Iraq emerged, known as ISIL, or the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant. The goal of ISIL was to unite all Islamic factions whether that meant brutal violence. Similar to the patterns we have observed before, ISIL is also a strict adherent to Islam, whose primary motive was to defuse Islam. Many who did not abide by Islam were killed, causing the organization to be feared by the international community. A recent alliance between ISIL and Boko Haram, whose name, not surprisingly, means Western education is forbidden, reveals the growing terrorism today. Clearly, both groups aimed for the globalization of Islam and the eradication of those who were enemies to God, including much of the Western world. Lastly, to denote Al-Qaeda's perception, its leader, Osama bin Laden, once claimed, it is the duty of all Muslims to enhance and strive for downright Islamic right. Overall, this truly resembles how, although um, big wars such as the Cold War World War II, Persian Gulf War have ended and more alliances have grown, there are still growing conflicts. And this can be com completely represented through the terrorism and growing groups and radical groups that have now been seen. And although everything else has declined, such as these Cold and Gulf Persian Gulf Wars, terrorism is on a rise. And this can be seen through bombings and mass destructions and this just shows that conflict will keep on proceeding. Now we will move on to the global trade organizations. We will resume this part three of the presentation in the next following video. So please on the Google um, website go to the global trade organization slide or um, subsection of the website and please watch the rest of the video. Thank you, and we will see you then.